Hey everyone, this is Luke Grand from Practical Farmers of Iowa welcoming you to our Farminar tonight. I wanted to just check in to see if everyone in the audience can hear us. We have folks from all over the country and I hope my voice is getting all the way to Massachusetts and Michigan. And I'm just so glad to have everybody with us again. I wanted to get started tonight right away. <clears throat> Please do put your emails and city and state in the chat box. We do like to keep in touch with our viewers and make sure we're responding to your needs. And uh, we'll be sure to we'll be sure to follow up with you for a quick survey t after tonight uh, tonight's farm and art, just to see how we're doing and make sure that we're on target, and so we can continue to improve these, uh, these this service to everybody else out there. Uh, also, note the viewer count in the lower right corner of your screen. P please feel free to just put the number of folks that are watching with you tonight from your connection. 42% of Iowa farmers say they will retire in the next five years, according to a, a rural life poll uh, that was done by Iowa State University back in 2010. Uh, that is a shocking number, and it's one that we take very seriously at Practical Farmers of Iowa, and that's why we work and we think we can work to build success in the next generation of farmers. Uh, we do that in a number of ways. Our online seminars like Farminars are just one of those ways we do that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about some other opportunities coming up that you can take advantage of to increase your chances of success in agriculture. But we do really care about the next generation. Here's uh, one family, the Rosemans in western Iowa. Ellen was in the middle there. Ellen was on as a farm and our speaker a couple weeks ago. And uh, just one of hundreds of families that are, that are members of Practical Farmers of Iowa. Uh, great folks and uh, that, that do love to help and share their knowledge. And Ron Roseman there on the, on the second from the left will be uh, he'll be uh, giving a farm in our uh, presentation next winter. So we're a tight-knit tight community, kind of like a family, uh, and it's a great uh, group to be a part of. We're in our almost done with our fall farm in our series now, just one more next week uh, that will conclude our fall farm in our series, setting up a system of record keeping and sticking to it. But don't be scared because we're going to have more to come in the wintertime. Uh, we won't be ending these at all, but we'll start a whole new series. Uh, with uh, different uh, topics, as you can see on your screen, uh, with a bunch of different uh, experts and experienced farmers and beginning farmers as well. Uh, one thing of note is we're going to have three CSA farms on January 17th, talking about three different scales of production for, for horticulture uh, in Iowa. Uh, excuse me, two are in Iowa and one of them is in Missouri. But we'll also include uh, livestock and large grain farm, uh, farm and our topics. So we've got something for everybody. Our farminars are uh, continually evolving, and we're really glad to, to be able to bring these to you with the support of the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program, a wonderful USDA-funded initiative to help beginning farmers get a chance to uh, enter the industry and be successful. We've done over 40 farminars like the one tonight, and we've had a real interest in horticulture from our members uh, dating back uh, 15 years or so. And we've been answering their needs more and more in the last decade. And uh, farm and are just one of the things we do to do that. Here's a photo of a field day. We put 30 field days on each year. 30 different farms open up their uh, doors and share their ideas and all their data and all their uh, ideas and different things uh, to help, help other farmers. So we do work together to help everybody farm better. That's what we are all about. So... We are going to do uh, a very specific thing tonight. Uh, we're going to have some introductions from our two guest speakers, the beginning farmer, uh, Julie Wilbur, and then Linda Holly, uh, the experienced farmer. We'll have a discussion that they've prepared uh, over uh, a topic uh, as you've, uh, about record keeping and, and, and setting up a good system. And we will invite your questions also from the audience uh, at that time uh, to you know, get your voices in the discussion and, and get your questions answered. And we will conclude promptly at 8.30. So that's how we're going to do that tonight, and we encourage you to, to be involved uh, as much as you're uh, interested in, in sharing your questions through the chat box. We are an open, supportive, and diverse organization. We advance profitable, ecologically sound, and community-enhancing approaches to agriculture, and uh, we are a very focused uh, grassroots nonprofit organization that serves its members well. You can succeed as a farmer by building your network, and getting priceless uh, advice and wisdom shared uh, with our wonderful network. So please do join our organization. 100 uh, individuals outside of the state of Iowa are members, and uh, you can join as well no matter where you're at. Uh, you can join online, and there's uh, some great benefits to be had, including a discount to our annual conference.
which is coming up January 13th and 14th, plus a bonus day on January 12th if you're interested in learning more about soils, limited to the first 45 uh, registrants. We have 30 at this point. And uh, it's a great day of learning from soils experts from Iowa State University. Additionally, you can register online by January 4th and save 10 bucks a day uh, on, over the walk-in registration. If it, the, the walk-in registration is a little bit more expensive, so if you can, it'd be great to uh, great to have you join online, or excuse me, join online and then register before January 4th. Here's some photos from last year's conference. A great opportunity to meet with mentors, to plan out your farm, getting expert advice from other folks and just visiting about uh, any questions you might have. Great food. We always pride ourselves on, on using the best food from the farmer members of our organization. So it's a real, uh, it's a real delight to enjoy with friends and, and have a good uh, full belly by the end of the day. You can meet experienced farmers, folks that have been been, been doing their, their farming uh, business for over 30 years or more, and uh, really tap into their knowledge. Everybody likes chicken hats. This is our one of our staff members, uh, Patrick Burke, wonderful wonderful friend of mine, good staff member, and he makes it make sure everybody's welcome by coming to the next uh, the, the uh, annual conference. So it's a great opportunity to have some fun too. Meet with exhibitors from all over the, the, mid, the Midwest, really. Uh, network of the industry and consumers alike. So do join us on uh, on our on our annual conference if you're available. We'd love to have you. But uh, but uh, if, if not the annual conference, then continue to enjoy our farm and our series. We'll continue again next week and then start up on January 10th. So let's begin tonight uh, with Julie Wilbur and Linda Holly. So we'll start with Julie, and uh, we'll get get a really good discussion going about record keeping systems. Whenever you're ready, Julie, you may begin. OK, my name is Julie Wilbur, and I live in Boone, Iowa, with my husband, Scott. And we farm um, on about 22 acres north of town. Um, 15 of acres of the land we just bought in 2010. Five acres we rent from a neighbor across the street, and we have two acres approximately just around our house. Um, so I guess in the government standards, I'm considered a beginning farmer because I'm more than five years experience, or is it three years experience, and under 10 years. Um, so we did get a beginning farmer loan for our land that we bought in 2010. and Scott is more of the planter, um, decision maker on how much we're going to plant and and choosing varieties. And I have to keep all the records of everything and make sure that he gives me all the information I need so that I can keep the records. Um, we grow um, a, a huge variety of items that helps um, eliminate so much risk in our farming career and we do CSA a lot of the a lot of stuff we grow for CSA we don't grow for a farmers market just because there are some more labor intensive items that we'd like to put in the CSA baskets as a privilege but it's not something that we want to grow in huge amounts and try to take to farmers market and sell or sell wholesale um, it's just not worth it. Um, there's a picture of our CSA sample on the left there, and then some small pumpkins that we harvested this year. We do a half share and a full share, so I'm not sure by looking at this what it is, but if I found the date, I would know because we have our half shares on a separate day than our full shares, just so I can keep my sanity. It gets confusing if you try to mix them on the same day. Um, can you go to the next picture, Luke? There's some of our early spring sugar snap peas. 
which I love, and I wish that they I could get them to last when it gets 98 degrees out, but they don't like the hot, dry weather very much. Um, next, strawberries. We have strawberries in the spring, cucumbers, some of our fresh lettuce in the spring. With the CSA, we try to make sure that we have um, products all throughout the whole season so that they are getting stuff in the spring as well as the fall. There's a couple of samples. And there's a lot of variety. Zucchini, cucumbers, grape tomatoes. Um, this just shows, this is um, my data. I took my data from this year on our sales. And we like to look at, um, you know, to see where we're actually getting our most money from. And, maybe where we need to concentrate on more. And it, it amazes me that we are still making more money at our farm stand than anywhere else. Um, it helps to live in a town where his parents live and my parents live and everybody knows us and the word gets out that stuff is ready to buy and they come out to the farm and buy stuff. This is a picture of our market stand very, very early in a season. I'm not sure what year it is, but as you can see, we just have maybe a few, looks like peas and cucumbers, maybe some green beans, obviously tomatoes and corn and melons and all that stuff is not ready yet. Um, this is a display. Um, Hy-Vee is doing a really good job of trying to promote local and so we sell a lot of stuff to Hy-Vee and put some of our stuff on display at the store and then we also sell the ISU and that's one of our pumpkins that they bought and they used as a centerpiece for the football game. We 2010 was quite a year. We bought our land and then we also bought a high tunnel and we built it in the fall and had to get the ground level and it took a lot more time than we thought it would, but we were maybe a little <laughs> particular about making sure it was done correctly too. It has the roll-up sides. It's um, a 26 by 90, 24 by 90. And it's got a nice big opening that we can drive the tractor in. Most of our plants, we um, Scott starts from seed. He buys all the seed and, and he starts the varieties and babies them until it's time for them to go outside. Um, that's my daughter in the golf cart and my son helping Scott in our, one of our little greenhouses covering plants in the spring when it's supposed to get cold. Um, we don't have a lot of labor. We hired our first um, actual employee this summer. And then this, that's my father and that's a CSA member that had their sons come out and help us just for fun. That's me in the spring planting transplants. Scott with all the transplants ready to go. And we had a sweet corn feed at our fair and we donated the corn and then we served the corn and we just did it for advertising so people got to try our corn and know that it's good and come out to the farm and buy it. Um, this is another thing that it's good for farmers market but especially for CSA to give them ideas of 
how to prepare the food and save the food for winter. Those are hot cherry bombs that are wrapped in bacon, which my husband and his friends love on the grill. And then I was just chopping up lots of peppers to freeze for winter. Those are killdeer eggs that they put in our field where we wanted to till and plant and they, the mama and daddy go crazy when you're anywhere near their nest. So my husband tilled around it. <laughs> um, for us, uh, you know, expenses, um, it's very easy for us to, you know, keep track of receipts, what you spend on um, tools and uh, seed and parts and repairs. Um, labor, like I said, we haven't had that much of an issue with labor until this year as far as employee records. And we have not been good in the past ever of trying to keep track of our labor, how many hours we spend planting, harvesting. Uh, this year we did have a high tunnel and we got a, we did a research um, thing for the high tunnel and had to keep track of all the inputs into the high tunnel, including labor. So um, that was good for us to see uh, how, many, how many hours we put in and what we got out and maybe what's a better item to put in the high tunnel. Um, and then mileage is always a good thing to keep track of um, if you're deducting mileage on your um, tax return. And also if you're doing deliveries to customers or wholesale deliveries, sometimes you think you're you know, getting a good deal, but if you're putting a lot of miles on, it might not be as good as you think. And we, you can keep a chart like in your vehicle and write it down every time you go somewhere. Sometimes I just look at like my invoices and I see, okay, I went to Hy-Vee, I went to ISU, I went to the farmer's market, you know, and I know the mileage to those places and so I can just figure it out by looking at other items. Um, I'm much better at keeping track of my sales than my expenses and I guess that's because it's more fun to see how your sales are doing and where you're getting the sales from. Um, I keep track of you know how much, how many pounds of tomatoes, how many cucumbers, to who you're selling it to. On, on, I have a QuickBucks program and I can break down. Um, that's how I was able to get the percentages, uh, who, how many tomatoes I sold to the market, how many, how much went to the CSA, how much went to the grocery stores. Uh, how did they pay? I actually break that down because we are in the WIC program. We take WIC checks. We also um, accept EBT food stamp cards. And um, so I just like to see if, if being involved in those programs is paying off or not. And then what did you sell? Um, that kind of goes with how much, you know, what varieties did you sell? Um, sometimes I keep track, especially on the corn. You know, are we still are we still selling early corn? Are we selling the bigger, larger, better, later varieties? Um, when that makes a difference, if you're looking back on your sales and it doesn't look like you had very much, maybe it was a Monday as opposed to a Saturday, or maybe June sales aren't as good as July sales when you have more stuff to sell. And then where, um, that goes back to whether it was the grocery store or farmer's market. Um, sometimes I'll look at my home sales and it looks like it was really good and I'm like, well, how come they were so high that day? Well, then I find, find out, oh, well, that's the day that Scott took a truckload to come and go and sold corn. So that was not just sales here at the farm, but when I totaled it, I categorized it in the home sales. And then there's 
so many miscellaneous items, um, like temperature. Sometimes, you know, our farmers market, we've had farmers market sales of five dollars. <laughs> and when I look back on that a couple of years from now, I want to know that, um, you know, it wasn't that we didn't have anything to harvest, it was that it rained all day. Um, community events, you know, like our, our county fair, um, things like that, that can affect your sales either negatively or positively. Um, referrals, that might be um, something you want to keep records of. Um, who sent them to your farm? If, you know, how did they find you? You know, did they see it in the newspaper? That works for marketing. Also, we have a lot of people that come out in July and they want strawberries. Well, we're done. But if I take down their name and phone number, I can call them next year when we have strawberries. Um, other records that you might need to keep are for gap information for farm safety. Pictures. I discovered doing this presentation that I didn't take very many pictures this year, and that's a good way of doing record keeping. Um, surveys. You can survey, survey CSA customers, survey just people in town to find out whether you have a potential market area or not. Um, keep track of yields and varieties. And I guess um, it's just necessary. There are certain things that you have to keep track of um, for taxes, government regulations, you know, financial reports for the banks if you're trying to get a loan. Um, but then, like, there's also those other things that um, may not seem that important, but it may be important to you. You don't have to do everything. As your business grows, you will need to change. And you don't have to record something just because you did it last year. Um, you know, as you change, certain things are going to be more important to you than others, and you might let some items go that you've been tracking and start tracking new things that are important to you. Uh, when Scott and I first started, we were part-time, and we actually had a SpongeBob notebook that we stole from one of our kids, and we called it the SpongeBob Bible. <laughs> And we kept track of our sales in that, and um, we'd always refer back to, you know, and Scott's like, well, what does it say in the SpongeBob Bible? So we'd go back and pull out the SpongeBob notebook and look at our records. So depending on your size, uh, you know, whatever works for you is what you need to do. All right. Great. Thank you, Julie. We're going to continue now with Linda, and then Julie and Linda are going to have some really good uh, back and forth about uh, questions about how to do certain kinds of record keeping that's more challenging, and we'll welcome your questions from the audience uh, as well. So, Linda, whenever you're free and ready, you can begin. Oh, I'm, I'm on board. Can you all hear me? Hopefully. Um, so, Julie, that was really great. I won't take very much time talking about my farm because I think the point of this workshop is really um, to talk about records and <laughs> hopefully how to how to start keeping them and sticking to it. And you already had a lot of really good things to say. So we'll just jump into a conversation about it and I'll kind of go through my slides quickly. So Luke, can I just fast can I forward them myself? I'm just going to try to do that. Oh, there it goes. All right, that's great. So as Luke said, I'm Linda Hawley. I'm with Gardens of Egan, and it's a farm in Farmington, Minnesota. Um, I've been with this farm for four years, and most farmers don't move around to a lot of different farms. I've had the privilege of farming at four different farms, and that gives me a lot of perspectives because every farm has been many, many ways the same and many ways different. So even though I don't have a CSA right now, I had a CSA for 15 years. I experienced with restaurant sales, um, roadside stand when I was in California. We um, have far I've farmed with an intern crew with um, H2A seasonal, 
seasonal crew that came up mostly from Mexico. I've run a very, very urban farm, 12 acres, surrounded by people with swimming pools. I've um, had livestock, mostly beef, and um, also sold processed foods. So that's in addition to what um, I'm doing right now, which is uh, 100 acres of uh, fresh market vegetables. Um, 50 or 60 acres are in vegetables in any season. We do quite a lot of soil building and cover cropping. And then, of course, we have some waterways and set-aside areas um, in that 100 acres. We sell 55% of our products direct to retailers, about 40% to distributors, and only 5% goes to our two farmers markets, which are both on the same day on Saturday. Um, that represents about 20 different crops, which is a fairly simple crop mix compared to what most um, fresh produce farmers farm, especially if they have a CSA farm. We do plant sales in May, and that has been a, a nice boon to, to extending our early season crops and income. Our produce sales is quite condensed. We don't do anything really in the winter. We start um, selling produce in late May when the transplants are just about winding down. And we go through the end of October, sometimes the first week in November. And that's it, which kind of leaves a lot of nice time for planning. Um, you have to manage your cash flow a lot better when you don't have um, winter sales, that's for sure. Um, we have a 12 season personal seasonal crew, 12 person seasonal crew. Um, two of them are year round, that's myself and um, John. And then we have two part-time managers that work, oh, 10 or 11 months, Susan and Mike. And then the rest of the crew is very seasonal, starting mostly in April and ending in October. So Julie sent me some questions. And these are the questions that were really just at the top of her list, which is, how do you assign costs? and which are direct costs for a certain crop and which are overhead costs. So I do want to talk about this kind of as the first thing and, and the slides that follow it kind of support my recommendation, but just to have a little um, broad overview before we get into looking at numbers and tables, I just want to say that um, Julie, it looks like she's keeping a lot of records. And when she lists it all, it looks like, oh my gosh, she's just keeping records. That's all she's doing all day. But it didn't seem like she was keeping any records that she didn't need to keep, except, um, yeah, really. I mean, she just that's how many records it takes to get through the season and then be able to look back at your farm and um, analyze anything and maybe ask those questions like, which crops should I grow more of and which crops should I grow less of, which is sort of what drives these questions that she had here. So I really say that um, you can assign, you can call anything overhead if you want to. If you only grew sweet corn, that a very simple farm with only one crop, then all your costs would be sort of overhead. There's some fixed costs that don't change, like if you have a mortgage payment. And there's some variable costs that change a lot. Whether where you buy seed from might make a big difference. But they could just all be assigned to one crop if that's all you had. But of course, most of us know that's not very realistic, whether you have livestock or vegetables. There's, there's always more than one thing you're producing. And so um, it's, it's going to get a little more complicated than that. But all of your financial kinds of records start with an income and expense report. And that comes from receipts of income and receipts of expenses. Just like Julie was saying, she, she finds it easy to keep receipts. And probably most of you are keeping them in some kind of um, computerized electronic bookkeeping. You wouldn't have to, but most people are starting to do that now. 
So um, your goal when you look at your farm is to find your net income per acre. And I also like to look at net income per unit sold. And again, if you have a super simple farm, you can do it for one unit, a pound or a dozen ears of corn or one ear of corn, whatever your unit might be. Um, in my example there, I use pounds. Like if you only grew potatoes, then your unit would be pounds. Then you start to get complicated like cabbage and bunches of kale. One might be sold by the pound, and one certainly is not going to be sold by the pound. You wouldn't sell kale by the pound unless it was bulk baby kale, which is not very, not many people are growing that. So sometimes you have to mix your units and keep that separate. But you should always, if possible, settle on a unit. So we settle on um, however we sell it. I sell mostly wholesale. So when I mark the box 24 count, then that count or that bunch is my unit. Even though um, I could sell things maybe by the unit or by the pound, once I sell it wholesale, that's the unit I stick with for that whole crop. Um, so what you really want to do is of course not have a one crop farm. Most of us don't. You want to divide up some important enterprises. Like if Julie really wants to know if she should grow more kale or grow more cabbage or grow more broccoli, she would have really an enterprise budget for every single crop. Or like I say there in that line, for only the selected significant crops. So. Um, if you grow 20 different crops like we do, we really only have eight crops that are important enough to us to keep an enterprise budget. So is that making sense so far that you would keep a separate budget for everything that's important and everything else that is kind of less significant, maybe minor um, things that you grow would be lumped together as all other. So Julie, I'm wondering um, if you can think now how many crops you really care to look at individually. Yes, she out there? and actually, yeah, I'm here. And actually, um, it's very easy for us to keep track of wholesale because we do invoicing. And every year, we do check our, our, our sales by by crop and we can see you know which crop we have the most sales of and you know if that's sweet corn pumpkins whatever you know we can look at those top items and maybe concentrate on bringing those out and actually seeing what the expenses are for those top crops right but you said wholesale was easy what about all those crops you grow for your farm stand? How do you keep track of those? For the farm stand and farmer's market, usually we don't keep track of how many tomatoes we sold, how much beans we sold, how much cucumbers we sold, because usually it's so chaotic and, um, you know, I, I I can tell you, okay, I made $200 at market, but I can't tell you how much of that was a certain item. And I don't keep track of that in my records. And, you know, it just gets so busy. <laughs> right. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, I know if I took three boxes of tomatoes and there were 20 pounds in each box that I had 60 pounds and it's all gone and I was selling it for $2 a pound, then I probably made $120 that day in tomatoes, but I don't actually record that. Right. Well, I would suggest that um, if you're ever going to use an enterprise budget system where you look at maybe three or four important crops, you really have to have 
five part five numbers, and the first number you have to have is the income. Mm -hmm. And you said you make twenty five percent of your income from your farm stand sales. That seems yeah. like a really important number to capture. And your farmers market, like for us, our farmers market sale is five percent. Kind of like so what? But we actually have come up with what I think is a workable and reasonable way to capture market sales. And I think you could do it at your farm stand, although we did this at our farm stand in California. And I know you have kids, and you don't have employees, and you're probably trying to get uh, your personal life straightened out while you're um, setting up the farm stand or whatever. So reality might be a little more difficult. But at the beginning of every market day, when we're actually we're putting things into the cooler to um, get ready for market, we record the amount of everything mm -hmm. that we're taking. And so it's like amount taken, and it might be 12 cases of you know broccoli and two cases of tomatoes or whatever, whatever number makes sense to us. And then when we unload the truck, we're recording how many got returned. And really, I have employees who go to the market and come back home. And they have to fill that out. Um, but they don't have to do the math. It's pretty easy to just count what you put on the truck and count what you take off the truck. And beyond that, I'll do the math and I'll crunch the numbers to say how much money. Because I have a little more time in the office some other time when it's not chaotic and it's not at the end of a 10-hour day. And we did a very, very similar thing for our farm stand when um, we had a cooler, although you could have just a place in your cooler, or a, certainly there's a place you must gather all your produce. And when we would put our produce there, we would simply record how many boxes we set in that area for our farm stand. And at some point, whatever makes sense, at the end of the day or at the end of the weekend, if the weekend's really busy, um, then you record how much is gone or how much is is still there, either one. And you can capture those numbers that way. But it's, you sort of have to make it very much a system. So nobody loads the market van without filling out that list of crops. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if it would work for you, but you could say to yourself, and it probably sounds like it will be you, you never set up the farm stand without making a list of the crops that you have right there to work with. And um, you know, price is important too. But frankly, um, our prices don't vary very much once we start market. Um, maybe the first week they're a little more expensive. If that number isn't captured, it's actually less important than if the total volume of tomatoes that I sold all year isn't captured. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And then, I mean, go ahead. I can keep track of what's going in and what's going out, but then, um, you know, there might be the tomato that fell off the table that got thrown away, and you know, so it's not going to be totally accurate, but at least it'll be give me a better guesstimate. I agree. There's always like this mysterious shrink, and I think <laughs> for us, it has a lot to do with the fact that you never give someone exactly a pound of anything. You always yeah. give them a little more than that. Exactly. And I really think that there's there's quite a lot of that that happens. But if we just kind of do our best at market and at the farm stand, at least we have some baseline, especially when 25% of your crops, maybe more than 25% of the favorite crops are being sold there. You don't want to just kind of ma be making some guesses. So. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this picture that's up there that's the enterprise budget. So an enterprise budget, this is like for your enterprise, let's call it sweet corn. Um, it has five parts. It's got the income, which you have to capture either through receipts or just those handwritten records of what you took to the market or what you took um, and put on your farm stand or you know what Scott took down to the come and go. Mm -hmm. um, did he if he just piled it all in a truck, is there any way to at least guesstimate how many dozen ears of corn went along with him? Maybe by counting at the end of the day how much money you had. Um, so then 
Then there's the production costs and the harvest and post-harvest costs. And those are really the direct costs, if you put them all together, the direct costs that it takes to produce that crop. And kind of the reason they recommend cutting out production separate from harvest and post-harvest is that the production cost is already sunk in before you've even sold that crop. That's what it takes to get it to the point of selling it. And then harvest and post-harvest um, and delivery, if you're delivering it, marketing it, whatever, um, those costs are, are really variable and that's where you kind of have some control over how much you're going to continue to invest in that crop once it's mature. If you want to lump them all together because that, that's more simpler for your enterprise budget, I think that's fine. I think once you start to use enterprise budgets more for decision making, you'll understand why you'd want to capture the production expenses separate from the harvest, post-harvest, and delivery separate. But if you don't, that's fine. And then, then there's the ownership and overhead costs. And, and one could be the ownership of the farm. How much does it just cost you? have that farm even if you don't grow any crops. So, you know, like your land rent, it's just a land rent, it's just a fact of life. That's not going to change whether you plant sweet corn or carrots. Um, and maybe the interest that you pay, um, you probably can't, at the cost of maintaining your driveway or whatever, those would be the cost of ownership. And then, and I think of overhead, and, and maybe that's a loaded word, we all throw it around a lot, but the way I think of overhead costs, they're costs that don't really relate directly to sweet corn. They're costs that I capture on a, in my, at my farm on a per acre basis. So I put compost on my whole farm, not just on the corn field, so I like to capture the compost costs per acre. And then I, I'm figuring out my enterprise budget per acre. I know what that is. Whereas there's some extra production costs for sweet corn that don't go on the whole farm. Like when I um, have a starter fertilizer at plant time. That's a production cost that's just for corn. And so I keep that separate. And we're going to talk a little bit about how I keep those in a minute, I think. And so then you'll get to the total cost at the bottom of the budget, and then you'll do some division, and you'll get your net income, your division, <laughs> subtract. Um, so you'll get your total income, your total expense, and then your net cash income. And you would have a unit, $54,300 per everything you raised. In this case, this is all just one whole farm. This is not a single enterprise budget. Um, so, Julie, if you have questions about that, we can talk about them. Otherwise, I want to move on to things that I calculate for my whole farm, like that I just calculate per acre. Okay. Um, hey, Luke. April says my mic is popping a lot. Is that my mic she's referring to? Yeah. Why don't you try to move your mic, uh, pick up a little farther away from your uh, your mouth? Because I think it's the the air hitting the mic. Oh. Yeah, I can do that. Can you still hear me now? Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, okay, I'll try that. Um, so on my farm, I use acre as my area. If you have a small farm um, and you plant things in beds, it's really nice to keep track of like bed feet or 100 feet of bed space. Some people keep track of row feet. Um, whatever unit makes sense. Um, 
we might have an opportunity to lay out our fields completely differently and we're thinking about laying them out on a tenth of an acre instead of a full acre. So you might have some opportunities to do something other than an acre. And on our farm, that's what works. So labor is a huge cost. But I like to take some of the labor on our farm that doesn't relate to harvest and calculate that on a dollar per acre basis. So John, who manages like all the cover crops and all the compost, and he fixes all the tractors, I take his wage because he never harvests. I take his wage and calculate it on a per acre. So whatever I pay John, I divide it by my full farm because he might be cutting trees or uh, mowing the waterway. So I just divide it by 100 acres. It's just easy math. And um, I also include the taxes that I pay for John and the workers' comp that goes to John. Um, then. I don't include that in my harvest labor. I keep track of my harvest labor a different way. And I think it's a really easy way. But when we get to it, you can kind of look at it and decide. And then like some other farm, whole farm costs that I have is fertility per acre. And that's kind of like my cover crop seed per acre. I don't plant the whole farm to cover crop, but I take that cover crop seed cost and divide it by the whole farm, because the whole farm gets cover cropped at some point, sometime. And then fertility per acre, I kind of do the same thing. I just do a whole farm fertility per acre, not how many acres I actually spread compost on this year, because mostly I spread it on the whole farm. Um, same thing I do for maintenance and repair of tractors and equipment that that we use for the whole farm. I keep the delivery truck and the farmer's market van separate for that, because I wouldn't need the delivery truck for everything, things that don't get delivered, or the market van for anything except what gets taken to the market. Um, let's see what that comment, net average income per acre. Oh, I also do, I also add all my income per acre. So if I make, if I have this net at the bottom, uh, $54,000 for my whole acre, my whole farm, I like to keep track of what's an average net return per acre for a crop. So that when I look at a single crop, I know whether it's above or below average. On our farm, average is $10,000 per acre. So when I grow broccoli for $7,000 an acre, it's actually a below average crop. And I would want to look very carefully at whether I'd want to grow more of something that's actually coming in below average. Does that make sense so far? Any questions, Julie? No, it makes sense. OK. You're probably already doing a lot of this. Um, one thing that I didn't do at first, when I first started farming, and now I've realized there's really good reasons to do this. It's to keep track of the real costs of some expensive items that don't get used for every crop. So when I. I place an order with a company that I get lots of my supplies from, like all my tea tape and all my um, plastic mulch and uh, like all the clips from my greenhouse. And I place that order. And when I get their invoice and it's all itemized out and I'm just paying that invoice, before I even pay it, I make a spreadsheet in Excel and I keep track of all of the stuff I bought. Like I bought tea tape. It comes in 7,500 foot roll. It costs me, it says $37, but I think it might be $137. And that's two cents per foot. So 
I know how many feet of row of tomatoes I have or cucumbers. And I'm going to really, truly, if I, if I want to do an enterprise budget for a crop that gets planted with tea tape under plastic mulch, I know how many feet of row I planted and how many cents it cost me to do that. Because I've kept the records when it's really easy to keep. That first time you pay that invoice, it's really easy to just go down the list put down the number of feet, crunch the numbers, and there it's there until next year when you probably are going to pay more because the price went up. Um, and I do it th for things that aren't supplies. Generally, for example, propane for the greenhouse. Um, I just kind of figure out the total amount of propane we burned for the greenhouse and how many days we burned it and I know, and then how many flats fit in a greenhouse, and it cost me 25 cents a week per flat to heat the greenhouse for those flats to be in there. That's how much the propane is. And it's kind of easy to do those calculations as you go. Um, if you save all of it until winter, and you have to dig out old propane receipts, from spring, then you're really less likely to go through that trouble to find out. But uh, we grow some plants in our greenhouse, and some plants get direct seeded. And there's a big difference in the amount of expenses it takes to grow a plant greenhouse versus direct seeded with a planter. So I feel like that the greenhouse costs are really important to keep. We've also calculated. Um, the cost of a planted plug tray, and that is the media that goes in the tray, the container itself, and the labor to fill it. It doesn't count the cost of the seed or the fuel to heat the greenhouse. Um, put that slide in there. But I think the key message on this slide is just find a way to make it really easy at the time when you're paying the bills or handling that invoice um, for the first time. And then you'll just have that record to refer to. And it is a lot of extra work. It's a lot of work to keep these records and then dig them back up when you um, are trying to crunch the numbers. So you really want to be selective about how many crops you're going to do some of these things for. Like once I've kept the records of all that tea tape and the plastic mulch, then that's just an, an extra easy way for me to add in any crops that might use tea tape or plastic mulch. It makes it a little easier. But, um, but truly, I think you could go overboard in how many records you keep. If you, um, you know, grow 50 crops, you are not going to be able to do an enterprise budget for all 50 crops. So this table shows an example of some special extra costs that you don't want to just do per acre. So kale happens to go through the greenhouse. I can't take the, all of my greenhouse costs and divide it over the whole farm because sweet corn, which we grow 10 acres of, doesn't grow in the greenhouse. And so that would really skew my greenhouse costs for the crops that do go through the greenhouse. So I know that I have to keep track of my greenhouse costs and add that back in just to my kale budget, if I'm doing a kale enterprise budget. And kale gets side dressed twice. So all my side dressing fertilizer, I know which crops I put it on and how many row feet. And if I use 50 bags of side dress fertilizer, I do the math, and then I find out how many well, I actually do it per acre, um, how much side dress fertilizer I spread per acre of side dress crop. And kale gets side dressed twice, so that's twice as much. And then kale's the only crop that we use a twist tie on. So all twist ties that get used up during the course of the year, that expense gets counted to the kale expenses. Um, so hopefully that's making sense. 
at the bottom of this slide, there's um, there's a URL for a really good website. It happens to be Iowa State, and lots of you are from Iowa. Um, that talks, I think, really clearly about keeping um, enterprise budgets. In fact, crunching all sorts of um, ag numbers. It's called. Well, it's the Ag DM part of their Iowa State University website. And uh, you can find that by following that link. It's really worth writing down all those letters and slashes and numbers. Um, so Julie, can you think of any crops that you feel like have some extra special costs attached to them that when you write your enterprise budget, you definitely know you need to account for those costs in that budget. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely, um, you know, some crops that require more money and labor as well than others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, like I said, we, we haven't kept track of labor. We kind of know in our head which, which those crops are and we're not going to, you know, sell them, you know, cheap wholesale because it's a lot of labor-intensive work, and and we probably yeah, like need to keep better track of that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So on this table, you can see my labor um, column has things in it like 3.5 boxes per hour average, and or a hundred pounds per hour to harvest peppers, 1,000 pounds per hour to pack peppers. And so the way we've captured that is not to um, keep track of all, the la all of our harvest labor in a big glom. Like today we harvested for five hours. Tomorrow we harvested for eight hours. Friday we harvest harvested for six hours. And then you get into August, and you actually don't have any harvest hours recorded, right? Because <laughs> August is August. Exactly. So what we do, because we know that there will be big gaps in our records if I just do, try to do it every single day, you'll get to a week or a, even a whole month where there's just so many gaps, you just start to not have confidence in your labor records. So, what we try to do is focus on, again, let's say your five, your five focus crops. And we keep track of labor maybe four times a year, believe it or not. So when we go out to pick kale, and it's a time when we're going to keep track of that labor, we make sure that, OK, today we're keeping track of labor. And we write down when we get back to the packing shed, um, let me see if I have an example in here. I think it's a couple slides away. Um, I can go back again, right, Luke? Eventually, as long as we're talking about this. How come it won't go forward? Ooh, there it is. That's hmm. I'm having a hard time making it go forward. Well, for some reason, we didn't even find the whole table that I was looking for. Um, hmm. Well, what I want to say is maybe Luke can make it move. Here we go. Hopefully, this one won't disappear. So when we go out to pick, yikes. When we go out, wow, Luke, I'm getting lost in my sheets here. Um, I think it might hold in place right now. OK. I don't know what number it is, but this one that we're on right now, that's the one I want to talk about. So when we go out okay. to harvest kale, and it's a, a day we're going to keep track of the numbers, or in this case, this slide shows broccoli. 
we go out, we know how many people went out, we know how many boxes we brought in, how many people, and how many hours it took us. So this is an example of maybe we'll keep track of harvesting broccoli five times a year, and then we're going to get our then we're going to get our number. Um, we won't pick five times in the same week. We try to um, pick five times when there are different weather conditions. Um, but I think that that gives us a really good average. So we went out and picked broccoli. Um, we picked it in field 15. That's not important except that we're certified organic and we have to keep track of that. But we picked 45 packed boxes with five people in three hours. And then I said it was very muddy. What that tells me is that's probably a low average. So, you know, this is all you have to do is do the math and you'll find out how many boxes per hour a person can do. Three boxes an hour. And then you can do some math with that and say that if it's going to cost you $14 for every hour, it might cost you $4.66 a box to, to get that broccoli box picked and packed. Um, but the whole point of this is you don't have to do this every single time. You can do it just five times a year and have some pretty good average numbers. Um, it's really scary to try to go back and find that slide that we were on, <laughs> but I think it's here. Yeah. And so where it says 3.5 boxes an hour average, that's a real average. People really do that. And I know if it costs me $10 an hour or $14 an hour, exactly how much my labor hours will be for my kale. And I can do some math and find out what my kale extra labor hours are. I have kind of a, um, on my farm, we do a few things in bunches, not very many. We do a lot of things by the pound. And we just keep track and make some aver keep track of some averages and then I kind of know what numbers to put in my enterprise budget as it relates to extra labor. If it's a very average crop, I don't put extra labor numbers in. Is that making sense? Let's see. So um, Julie, this is just a comment from you that you kept records for items grown in the high tunnel. Not fun or easy, but in the end it was nice to see how many hours you spent. That was something that you could do and follow through on in the whole year because it was just like one concentrated thing. And, um, and I think then when you get that um, reward of being able to crunch some numbers that relate to your high tunnel, then you realize that there are maybe some other parts of your farm that you want to invest the same amount of energy and time into. But you know you couldn't do it for your whole farm operation. So one hopefully, thing, go ahead. One thing that was interesting about that study is they were just keeping track of planting and harvesting, but not um, like, you know, Scott plants everything from seed. So I was trying to keep track of, you know, when he's out there, putting the dirt in the boxes, putting the seeds in the boxes, watering the flats. And they said, no, we're not keeping track of that. We're just keeping track of, you know, how many hours it takes you to plant into the ground. And so I just thought that was kind of skewed because people, there might be some people out there just going and buying plants and sticking them in. And but that's something in the future that I might want to keep track of just because that's, Something I always yeah. wonder is, are we saving money by, you know, doing this ourselves, or would it be better to go buy plants from somewhere? Well, I think that's a really good thing to keep track of is your greenhouse costs. Mm -hmm. And um, we keep track of it by flats per week because, you know, cucumbers are only in there for three or maybe four weeks, and tomatoes might be in there for six or eight weeks. Right. And so um, we found a, a flat week. We call it a flat week. That's a unit. Um, 
is a really helpful thing to keep track of and you know, like how much it costs to heat that flat. Also, are you going to keep track of all the time you spend watering it? No, but you could keep track of how long it takes you to water the greenhouse on four or five different weeks, just one day. So I think that's what we try to do is just capture a picture in time of, you know, like, wow, we spent five hours today actually just watering the greenhouse because now it's May and it's really hot out. And then in April, maybe you only spend one hour a day watering the greenhouse. And so if you could keep track of one day a week for every week that you're in the greenhouse, you'd have some good numbers to go on because labor is not insignificant even if you're not paying employees to do it. So um, I want to look just really carefully, I mean briefly, at this kale per acre enterprise budget. But I think we could just beat the enterprise budget idea to death if we wanted to. And there's probably more interesting things to talk about. Um, so this is kale. And we sold 3,000, this is the income part, 3,000 cases at $25 a case. Our total receipts was $75,000. But we grew three acres of it. And this is kale per acre. Um, I'm going to use my little pointer. How about that? I think I can do that. Hmm. My pointer is not coming with me, Luke. Hmm. So you got to click on the screen where yeah. you want it to be. So you, you press the clicker button and then you click on the share screen where you want the clicker to go. There you oh, there we go. Okay, and it moves as long as I hold my mouse down. Wow, it's really cool. Okay, sorry. Um, so that was three acres of it, and I want a per acre cost, so I divided by three, and I got $25,000 an acre. And then um, then there's the expense side of things. And this is where sometimes people get a little bit lost. Um, I couldn't do a complete enterprise budget because there are a lot of different expenses involved. But I tried to do an example of seed. I know exactly how many seeds I bought for kale. And, and I took that $290. And I divided it by three acres. And it was $97 of seed per acre. And then side dressing, as we said before, is something that just happens to kale, or kale and broccoli or kale, broccoli, and I don't know, one or two other crops. So I have to include that as a special cost. So I keep track of it separate, and it happens to cost me $50 per acre side dress. So I include that number. And then the fertilizer is just like how much I put compost on my whole farm. So it's a per acre cost. I know that number. My non-harvest labor, that's like how much John costs me to exist. He doesn't harvest anything. And so now I got my direct cost of production. So that's like the first set of expenses. That's how much it costs to just get there until we're going to harvest. And then everything, all the expenses below that relate to harvesting, post-harvest handling. So we have our twist high cost. And I always keep dividing everything by three because we had three acres of it, and I want a per acre cost. We had harvest labor, and that was, remember I said I could do, um, it cost me $4 a box, and I got that number from that previous table where we picked three and a half boxes uh, of kale per hour on average. So this is truly an average, but if I sold 3,000 cases and they each cost me $4, that was $12,000 in labor. And divided by three acres is $4,000 per acre of harvest labor. And then my boxes, I have a real number of boxes I used and a real cost for them. So now I have um, my direct harvest and post-harvest costs. And then below that, I have some like whole farm overhead, like how much it costs to own irrigation for the whole farm to 
rent my land or pay my mortgage, all of my machinery depreciation, and I get another total of expenses there. So my total cost per acre, three sets of expenses all added up. And my net income per acre, I hope I did this right, is $17,000 per acre for net. Um, kale's actually, this is actually like kind of close to real kale numbers. It's not a complete um, fabrication, although I wouldn't say that exactly what, I, what we did this year. It's really close. Kale's a really good crop if you can sell a lot of it. Um, so I, I hope that just explains a little bit about that enterprise budget, enough so that when you really want to make one, you can go to the Iowa State website and it won't just be all like a foreign language, it'll be a little bit familiar. And then I think what's on the Iowa State website could be really helpful. So Julie talked about labor somewhat and said, you know, she just works all the time and she can't figure out how she's supposed to keep track of her labor hours. So I, I really suggest that you do the same thing you're going to do with your kale labor hours or your watering labor hours in the greenhouse. And that could be one day a week, not the same day every week, one day a week, every year, at all season of the year, you just write down your task hours. Like you were in the office for two and a half hours, you did delivery for three hours, harvest for one hour, packing shed for four hours. On July 10th, you worked 10 and a half hours. And if you really only have to recreate that once a week, I think you can do it. And it still won't be easy because at the end of the day, you'll really, on my experience is I have a really hard time even remembering what I did in the morning. But if you, I think if you try to stick to that schedule, it's realistic and you'll have some weeks that are blank, but you'll get a sense for, on average, how many hours you work a day and if it's important to you what you spend those hours on. And maybe just pick four categories, or four general categories. And you can make them up for whatever makes sense on your farm. I found that when I was keeping track of my harvest hours for the high tunnel study, I actually yep. worked harder and better because I would say, OK, it's you know, 8 o'clock, and I'm starting picking grape tomatoes. And I would pick, you know, till I was done. OK, it's 9 o'clock. And I wanted to know how much can I actually pick in an hour, totally concentrating on just picking. Because so many times, you know, I'm picking, and oh, I pull, pull a few weeds, and you know, <laughs> pick, pick the worms off the tomato plants, and you know, because there's so many other things that you get distracted by. But I just wanted to make sure it was total harvest labor, not uh -huh. anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that's, um, that's an interesting example of when you're focusing on how you're spending your time, maybe you are spending it even more focused than usual. Uh -huh. Which I, That does somewhat happen when we keep our harvest records, when we say, OK, we really have to keep track of how many cases per hour, or how many bunches, or heads, or whatever, or pounds. I think that does focus people and might skew their efficiency just a little bit. But that's not a bad thing, is it? I mean, <laughs> it's always good to have people work in a more focused way, I think. Um, so I think when I've kept track of my hours, and again, it was when I was participating in a study, like Julie was participating in this high tunnel study, it, it made me realize that there is a value to keeping records, definitely. You have to look at them again. Otherwise, they're just paper filling a drawer. But um, that was really illuminating to try to keep track of my hours. And um, that's kind of how I did it. I tried to keep track every day, and I realized I would just completely fall behind. So I said, OK, I'm going to do it once a week. And I'm not going to do it every Monday or every Sunday. I'm just going to try to pick a different day. And 
and I was able to keep up with that goal. It was a much more realistic goal. Um, also, I recently attended um, a financial record keeping workshop that was extremely good and one of the presenters was Craig Chase from Iowa State and what he emphasized in the in this class was that if you're ever going to be profitable and know whether you're profitable you really have to include your labor and a value for that labor so he was encouraging people not just to keep track of how many hours they worked he was encouraging people to give themselves a salary or a wage or a owner's draw on a regular basis even if it's a really small amount of money just to have that and fit it into your budget um, because otherwise if you only get what's left then really there will never be all that much left for you because <laughs> you won't be looking at your budget with the idea that you have to pay yourself so I think that was good advice from Craig. So Luke, you're asking me, what do I do with the data next? Like this data right here on this slide? Is that what you mean? Oh, I guess I was thinking after you collect all this, all this uh, data, um, like the weekly data of your hours, what do you do with it next? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. Um, Julie asked, how do I keep track of my hours? And so I told her how I learned to keep track of my own hours. Um, I think keeping track of your own hours can simply give you a perspective on how profitable you want to be. Because ultimately, you want to pay yourself for your work. And if you could go out and get a less satisfying job that paid you twice as much at, at the end of five or even ten years, some farmers look at how much they're making and how many hours they're spending, and they're really disappointed by that. So I think that having a sense for how many hours you worked and how much profit you got to keep or take home and put in your pocket at the end of the year is a very important decision-making tool. I mean, are you going to keep doing this if you're not paying yourself back what you think you're worth or what you think you could make somewhere else? And, you know, holistic resource management, I mean, they talk a lot about lifestyle and a satisfactory way to spend your time and, and how feeling good about what you're doing. It's not just about the money. And so you have to keep that in mind. But really, on the other hand, um, you can't continue to work for $5 an hour after 10 years because you won't have any money to pay your doctor bill <laughs> when you get to be my age. It's, it's kind of a serious, a serious piece of information that you really need to make some decisions about your farm. Or it can make you feel really good about your farm, too. I don't think farming is always unprofitable by any stretch. Um, OK. We already talked about this one, I believe. Um, so when I was talking about what you could do to capture your own hours or your labor hours for a specific crop, you can do the same thing to capture time drivers spend behind the wheel that you have to pay them or time people spend weeding. Um, you can't capture everything, but on our farm, it costs a lot of money to pay someone to drive our product to do deliveries, and it costs a lot of money to weed crops. And so we do try to capture these labor hours. Um, and it can be an average. You don't have to ask people to keep track of their hours, or you don't have to keep track of them for them every single day if that's not realistic. Um, another question that Julie asked was, is there any way to guarantee a price? Well, 
think we all know that it's kind of not true. There's no way to guarantee a price, except for with CSA, which is pre-sold. Um, but at the wholesale and the farmer's market, those markets are so volatile. Um, Julie gave a really good example of um, the Hy-Vee grocery store agreeing to one price in one year, and the next year, the price they were willing to pay was vastly different. Um, I think that I'm really fortunate. But the wholesalers and retailers that I sell to are extremely dedicated to local. And we have meetings in the winter where we talk about price, and the price doesn't vary dramatically. Um, once we get into the season, we kind of know what, uh, within an approximation, what we're going to pay. But um, sometimes during those buyer meetings, especially with wholesalers, they'll suggest, well, last year we paid you, you know, $24 a box for kale, but on a regular basis we're only paying $16 for kale from California. So we're not going to be able to pay you 24 anymore. And this is like a real conversation I had. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to be able to sell you kale for $16. But I really had no idea how much I could sell them kale for. And so then um, I learned about this little miracle table called the break-even price table. And you have to have some data from previous years. Um, or you can get some data off of websites, but I would say that it's not reliable enough to make decisions on. So if you know your total cost per acre, which we were just talking about, an enterprise budget that should give you that, or you can just divide your whole farm if you don't have the ability to do an enterprise budget yet because you don't have detailed enough records, then just take your whole cost per farmed acre, now you've got a cost per acre for any crop, divide by the price per carton that you're going to earn, like if they're giving you $10 a carton, and you'll get the, the break-even point will be in cartons per acre on this table. Maybe it makes more sense if we go to the table. There's some formatting problems here, but this column, let's see if I can make my pointer work. Yeah, this column is price. And this is the variable that's in our example that we're going to talk about. And this column over here is yield in pounds. And let's just say that you've got two years worth of records. And you've been yielding between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds an acre. And, or for this whole crop, let's just say for the whole crop. That's how many pounds you've been growing of something. And they're willing to pay you three fifty a pound. And um, you know your you know your enterprise budget tells you, or your whole farm budget tells you, it costs you. $5,250 to grow that crop, then in order to break even, they will have to pay you $350. These are your costs. You're going to have to yield 1,500 pounds. Well, if you say to yourself, in my best year, I yielded 1,500 pounds, then, and these are my costs, then maybe you're willing to say, OK. I'll sell it to you for 350. But if you sell it to them for 450, now this cost, if this was your break even cost over here, that's your the cost to produce your crop. Now that cost is more like right here. And you would only have to yield about 1250 pounds. That's a lot more likely you could actually do that. It's kind of right in the middle of what your average is for any year. So maybe a wiser farmer would be negotiating to at least get paid for 50 a pound. Because 350 is going to give you almost no margin for error. You're going to have to have a pretty darn good year. 
if indeed you know that your expenses to grow that crop are right about here. Is that table making any sense to you, Julie? Is the break-even table no profit? So like yeah, that's no profit. That's breaking even. So if you sell at 350, 1500 pounds, and you get 5250, that's also your cost, the 5250. So if you want to make a profit, 5250 was my cost. So you want to go higher if you want a profit. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So this is just your break even. If 5250 was your cost to produce that crop, 350 will only let you break even and only if you're like growing at the highest yield you've grown at so far. You can see a break even table really only works if you've got a couple years worth of data and you've got a range of dollars that you can imagine you'll be able to charge and if you know your enterprise cost in your enterprise budget. So like I just feel like this is a useful table. It has some limits. But with a crop that you're really going to shop around to wholesalers that are a little bit uh, risky, like high V, it would be really useful if you could create a table like this and, and plug in some prices that you think are realistic to ask for. This was actually um, a garlic table. So that's why it's $3.50 a pound all the way to $7.50 a pound. Um, somebody really got that range when they grew garlic for wholesale or for seed. And they could you know, kind of judge what kind of yields they were going to have to have um, if they were going to go from seed down to selling wholesale. So. But yeah, you got it exactly right, Julie. That's just your break even. And that's no one's goal, right? So do you just leave it in the field if, you, um, if you're going to break even on something? Uh, that's, a really, that's kind of why you want to have that enterprise budget divided into two parts, the top part being how much it costs you just to get how much it costs you just to get your crop in the ground ready to harvest. That's a nice number to know because you already invested those costs. It would be nice to at least regain those costs if possible. So yeah, I've actually made some choices to not harvest something, you know, to just leave it in the ground because we were going to, you know, lose 50 cents on every case we sold. So the more cases we sold, the the more we lost. Um, Julie asked another question, which was something like, well, should I sell my winter squash wholesale for 40 cents a pound, or should I take it to the farmer's market and try to sell it for a dollar? But I may not be able to sell it all at the farmer's market. Or, you know, that's more of a risk and wholesale is more of a sure sale. Um, maybe the lower price could actually be a better choice. Another question Julie asked was, should I put up a cooler so we can store some crops and over time we'll actually get a better price? Because when we have to sell them in a short little window, we end up selling them for a cheaper price. So um, there's only three minutes left, Luke. Wow. I think we should just maybe ask questions. <laughs> let me just mm, let me just tell you about this this partial budget table. It might be help a helpful thing for people to plug numbers in, and they might really have those numbers. So it's a table where you put in. If I sold something at the farmer's market, this would be my increase in income, and my decrease in costs would be these. But on the other hand, um, I would have a decrease in income of my sh guaranteed $40. And then I have some increase in costs, because I have to drive to the market and pay market labor. And 
in the end, I don't know why the formatting was bad, but it looks like you'd ha have a net gain of $68 if you took it to the farmer's market. Then Julie would have to ask herself, is that worth it to take it to the farmer's market and risk not selling it? Mm, since if it's winter squash and it's not going to spoil, then maybe so, because she'd have several weeks over which to sell it. So I don't know if this table is maybe a little too complicated to describe in uh, one or two minutes, but it's called a partial budget table. And it's just a list of the positives and the negatives for two separate choices. And there's an um, example of the cooler. And then I guess a parting shot is um, keeping a really informal journal can, over time, if you're going to farm for years and years, um, really capture some good patterns, some patterns for you to look at, like July is always a slow month at the farm stand, or um, August is always so hot, no one comes, or it never rains in August, don't plant your cover crops then. You can kind of gather some patterns if you're willing to keep um, you know, a really informal journal that actually might be a pleasant task to have. So there's probably not time for questions, is there, Luke? If anybody has a burning question, I would uh, I would entertain I would entertain it now. I'll forever hold your peace. They always say you're supposed to wait thirty seconds before you conclude the question opportunity. <laughs> well, Ross Smith didn't have a question. He just said, "Good info, lady." Very well then. I will uh, just like to thank uh, our speaker. I can't believe that it was 90 minutes already, Linda. It just was so fascinating. I was just uh, on the edge of my seat. Um, also, wanted to thank Julie. Uh, both oh, did a really come good on! <laughs> <laughs> I, I was. I'm not joking. I was. That's just like I don't know. I was just writing feverishly. I'm sure Julie was the same way. Well, I would, Julie, I really, anytime you have some questions or frustrations with your record keeping, now you have my email and phone number and we could, I would definitely like to lend some encouragement on the record keeping part. Yes, you have a lot of good ideas. This is our second year. Well, I have to say that, um, and this is yeah, but I did too, Luke, so I can come back and watch this, right, if yeah. I want to see the tables? This will be on our website so everybody can come back and watch it again. Right. Very good. Thanks to all the participants, even though um, sometimes people have more questions and type a lot more. It was, um, maybe we overwhelmed them with talking too much. Not at all. Join us next week as we uh, conclude our fall series with a uh, speaker from Michigan, Adam Montry, who's going to be visiting about uh, growing in high tunnels. Uh, he's been with us for this is his third year in a row now, a uh, regular contributor to Farminars, like Linda now. It's her second year, was tonight uh, contributing. And uh, we'd love to continue learning with you throughout the winter as well, uh, starting on January 10th. So next Tuesday we'll be online again after Christmas, and then we'll take a break until January 10th where we will uh, continue weekly seminars through March 13th.